Raider Nation, it's that time of the week again. Subscribe and tune in to get the latest news and analysis on everything silver and black. But yes, the Las Vegas Raiders have their guy, Josh McDaniels. Looking for objective opinions and interviews with A-list guests? Just pod, baby. Congrats on 100 episodes. I'm happy for you guys. Keep doing your thing, and thanks for having me, man. It was a blast. Look no further. You are listening to Just Pod, baby, a Las Vegas Raiders podcast. Brought to you by SportsNot.com. The prime thing is you have to win. You have to win. Otherwise, you can't be a success in professional football. And now your host, Evan Grote. Welcome back, Raider Nation, and new episode of Just Pod Baby, a Las Vegas Raiders podcast is now on deck. Glad to have you joining me again this week. You can find Just Pod Baby on all the major podcasting platforms, so please subscribe to the show if you don't already. You can also find all of the episodes archived over at JustPodBaby.com, and we are brought to you by SportsNot.com. The 2023 offseason program is now in the books for the Raiders. What did we learn from this past offseason? That will be a topic in segment one of the show. As I promised you guys a couple of weeks ago, we will begin our Behind Enemy Lines tour. Each offseason, I like to do this segment where we bring on a guest who covers one of the opposing teams in the AFC West Division to get you a feel for where the other teams uh, stand and so we will be joined by Jesse Newell who covers the defending Super Bowl champions the Chiefs for the Kansas City Star so we'll have that coming up here in segment number two and then some quick programming notes here before we get underway for this week you can plan now for at least the next let's let's say at least the next month until training camp begins anyways that I will probably be going to a a every other week schedule as we are now in that dead period of the NFL calendar. You hope that it's a quiet time for the Raiders. Pending any breaking news, you know, maybe Josh Jacobs signs a contract or or, or uh, signs his franchise tags. Anything breaking that goes down, I'll hop on behind the mic here, but you can plan on going every other week now uh, for at least the next month. Um, but once camp gets underway, I will be back at it once a week again throughout the summer, uh, the end of summer, I should say, uh, throughout the preseason, and then right up until the the start of the regular season as well. Now, a couple of pe- uh, pieces, excuse me, of of news this week surrounding the Raiders. They did complete um, their last session of of OTAs this past week, and and during the week they did sign. The final two players from their 2023 draft class, Jacorian Bennett signed. He was unsigned to this point, and Michael Mayer as well. They they got both of those two guys um, locked up with their rookie contracts, and 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 both of those two players are going to be expected to come in right away and play and contribute. In the case of Jacorian Bennett, he's stepping in to a cornerback room that is is full of question marks uh, going into the season. So he should have every opportunity to be able to, to get right in there and make a case for himself to earn some serious reps on that defense. Now, early reports from minicamp and OTAs have been, have been pretty positive with Bennett. Um, the Athletic reported last week that Bennett was working with the first team. So that's, that's a good sign uh, at the outside, right, on, uh, at the uh, cornerback position. Uh, but not complete, not, not exclusively. He wasn't only working um, with the first team, uh, so don't get too excited. Uh, there was a lot of rotating of players in and out with the first team, with the second team, even the third team. So they're taking a look at several different players at, with several different uh, lineups. But the fact that he's you know getting some looks there is a good sign. Now the same can be said for Michael Mayer. You know, when you look at the tight end position, other than Austin Hooper, there's not a lot of competition there in front of him. So, again, Mayer should be able to come right in early on, compete. Uh, they traded up in round two, drafted him. Uh, they did all that for a reason. He's a talented kid. He's a complete tight end. He can he can block. He can catch passes. He does all the things that you look for. So I would fully expect him uh, to be the starter in week one for the Raiders. Now, at the top of the show... In the intro of the show there, I was asking the question, what did we learn from the Raiders this past offseason? So we're going to get into that right now, right up until we get to our break. But, um, you know, we are now in the second offseason under the McDaniels-Ziegler era. And uh, this one felt much different than their first go-around. 
it was a completely different approach in this second year uh, for the, the, the brain trust behind this whole operation here. There was a lot of excitement last year. The expectations were really high last year when they brought in Devontae Adams. They brought in Max, uh, excuse me, not Max Crosby, Chandler Jones. They re-signed Max Crosby. They re-signed Hunter Renfro. Okay, they took care of a lot of their own guys. They re-upped Derek Carr as well. So there was excitement and energy uh, within the fan base. I'm not so sure the national media felt the same way, uh, but nonetheless, Ziegler wasted no time coming in and making changes and making his presence felt right away. It was very clear early on that they were going for it last year. They felt that they had enough to be competitive within that division. Obviously, things went terribly wrong last year, and there's no other way to put it. Things went terribly wrong. Um, And there's a lot of places that uh, the finger can be pointed, and we pointed the finger at a lot of those areas last year. We're not going to get into that now, but because of the failures of last season, it resulted in a complete 180, a complete change in philosophy of, of how this team would be built and what it would look like going forward. The Raiders are now in rebuilding mode, something we have talked a lot about. You've heard a lot about it. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it, in fact. Um, so that is the first thing we learned. The Raiders are now in, in a rebuild. And you could see it after the moves that were made in free agency that the plan uh, would not be to bring in high pi- high price free agents. Uh, they had some money to spend in free agency, but they didn't um, go out and spend a lot of it on one one or two or three players. They kind of sprinkled it around. Um, they are they did not try to buy themselves um, into the playoffs. Rather, the blueprint now is to uh, bring in pieces who fit what they're trying to do with this team. But but the 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 main. Um, lifeline of this team is going to be to grow through the draft and develop a, a stable of homegrown talent. Dave Ziegler talked about it a lot when he was doing press conferences uh, during prior to free agency, prior to the draft. That was a major goal was to try to replenish some of that talent, um, that homegrown talent. Now, if you look at many of the contracts that were given out uh, by the Raiders, you're going to notice that the majority of them are short-term one-year deals. And, 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 and many of them, uh, whether some of you liked it or not, had former ties to the Patriots and, and Josh McDaniels. That's what they were focusing on doing. There's a certain type of player that the Raiders are looking for. And I feel that, that the term, we hear this term all the time, culture change. We hear it in all sports, not just the NFL. And, and I think it's a little bit overused. I'm a little bit tired of hearing it, especially as a Raiders fan. I'm sure a lot of you guys feel the same way because in in the past 15 to 20 years, it seems like every time there's a new coach brought in and a new front office brought in, we keep hearing about trying to change the culture, changing the mindset. And year after year, it has failed. John Gruden failed. Jack Del Rio failed. The, the coaches before him failed. In year one, Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler, they failed. But uh, whether you like it or not, um, this is where this Raider team is, and it's they're in a rebuild. The second thing I think we we learned from this offseason that is along with a rebuild has to come patience. So I think as much as you don't want to hear this again, I think you, you have to be patient, and it's difficult for us to hear that because it's been a long, long time since the Raiders have, have had a consistent winner, and, and, and it seems like year after year, Guys like myself are telling you to sit there and be patient, and I, you know, I, I don't know what else to say. But um, this is where the organization is at. This is where the franchise is at. And if you think it's going to happen overnight, I think you're going to be left uh, very frustrated and and upset with with the results. Uh, they're going to be relying on a very young uh, set of players, especially on defense. Think about the rotation on the defensive line alone: Matthew Butler. And, and Neil Farrell Jr., who were rookies last year. They throw another rookie into the mix this year with Byron Young. If you want to toss in Tyree Wilson and include him along the defensive line as well. Um, I talked a lot about the youth and inexperience at linebacker on last week's show. The secondary, they're going to be faced with the same problem. Nate Hobbs, still a young player. Can he return to his rookie year form? That's going to be a big question that needs to be answered. Trayvon Merrig, you know, he was talked about as a first-round draft pick. Slipped to the second round. He has not lived up 
to the hype coming out of college. He needs to start playing better. He is still a very young player. They drafted two rookies who eventually could be key parts in the secondary as well in Jacorian Bennett and Chris Smith. So it's a work in progress right now on defense. I do think they took some steps, maybe not uh, enough steps, um, but when I say they, I'm talking about the front office. I think some progress was made to address the defense, to shore up the defense. We know that was objective number one this offseason after finding a quarterback. Uh, but this is not going to happen overnight. And as you know, um, you know, y- you're going to have to be patient. I'm preaching patience once again. Easier said than done. I understand. I totally get that some of you fans may not want to be patient. And that's fine as well. But I'm just trying to be realistic here with my expectations. And, you know, I'm looking for small victories, at least early on in the season anyways. You know, how does this team respond to McDaniels in year two? There was some controversy last year. We know this. We learned that this week between the quarterback and and the head coach. Okay. How does the team respond in year two? Do we see some further development? with some of the young players like Dylan Parham, Divine Diablo, Trayvon Merrig. How about some of the rookies? Do they develop right away? Do we see them contributing? Okay, how does the draft class looking? This was their first full draft class with Ziegler and McDaniels. You want to see some of those things. Those are the things that I'm going to be looking for uh, early in the season. And, and in my opinion, and you may disagree with this, but it's not going to be all about wins and losses this year. And, and we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago who said this, and I and I thought it made a lot of sense now that I'm thinking back on it. Of course, you want to win games, but I'm just not so sure that's the main objective this year. I don't expect the Raiders to push to be a playoff team anyway, so I want to see that the team believes in the coach. I want to see that the coach has, has grown, has shown some growth in his second year and his uh, – decision making, how he calls games, those types of things, and that the players uh, are playing hard, they're playing smart, and they're playing competitive football. Those are some of the, couple of the things that I'll be looking for. Uh, the third takeaway that uh, from this offseason, uh, in my eyes, is that my concerns with Jimmy Garoppolo, they've only been confirmed from this past offseason. Garoppolo has been a major topic on on this podcast over the last three to four months, and he will continue to be a topic throughout the season, I'm sure, because, well, he is the quarterback, and as you know, I believe the quarterback is is not only the most important position in football, but I think it's the most important position in in all of pro sports. Um, As you know, I did not want the Raiders to sign Garoppolo. I understand why they did that. Uh, They they did make that move, Um, but you know, my tensions have not been eased at all with, with, with Jimmy Garoppolo uh, from the way it has played out going all the way back to his introductory press conference, which was delayed because he failed the physical. Then he had to rework the con- the language in the contract to then missing all of the time in the offseason program, all the on the field time, at least. It sounds like they're 100% confident that he will be there to start training camp, but it's a major roll of the dice. We know this. The health of Jimmy Garoppolo will loom large over the success of this Raiders offense the entire season. And the fourth takeaway, the fourth thing that I learned from this past offseason is that Josh Jacobs might be willing to play hardball with the Raiders with his contract situation. I talked about it a lot on last week's show, so I'm not going to get into it too much here, but if you've been following the situation this past week, there's been some passive-aggressive uh, tweets that were being sent out on social media. So um, I, I still think at the end of the day, um, he's going to he's gonna eventually sign the franchise tag. Um, he may end up holding out, maybe missing a week or two of training camp, uh, but I don't foresee uh, Dave Ziegler budging much and, and giving him and paying him all this money. The market is what it is. Saquon Barkley also is in this situation. Tony Pollard is in this situation. A lot of good running backs out there. Delvin Cook now on the market. So um, this is not just a Josh Jacobs thing now. This is kind of a a, a league-wide view of the running back position. So I, I don't expect the Raiders to, to to move from their stance on this. So I, I think eventually if Josh Jacobs wants to earn money this year, he's going to have to sign that franchise tag. All right, guys, 
Uh, We're going to get to a quick break right now. I I do want to get us ready uh, for our guest in segment number two. We're going to be joined by Jesse Newell, who is a Chiefs beat writer for the Kansas City Star. We're going to take a look at some of the moves that the Chiefs have made this offseason and kind of where they stand right now as they've wrapped up their three-day mandatory minicamp this week out in Kansas City. So you don't want to miss that conversation. Uh, You are listening to Just Pod Baby brought to you by SportsNot.com. And we are back now, Just Pod Baby segment number two, Father's Day weekend here. I want to wish all those fathers out there a happy Father's Day weekend. I know my family and I are going to be spending some time together this weekend, going to head up to Canada, spend some time over at the beach, maybe get the boat out this weekend as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, But I do want to wish all the fathers out there a happy Father's Day. Uh, what we're going to do now is we are going to go out to the phone lines and we're going to uh, welcome in our guest who covers the Chiefs for the Kansas City Star. Jesse Newell joins us as we do go behind enemy lines here now and take a look around the AFC West division to get an off-season update. We start our tour with the Kansas City Chiefs and Jesse, we appreciate you spending some time with us. It was a much quieter off-season uh, for the Chiefs coming off their second Super Bowl title, the Patrick Mahomes era. I think back to this time last year when we did this show, there was a lot of question marks surrounding the wide receiver position. They had just traded away Tyreek Hill. They drafted Sky Moore. They added a couple of free agents to the group as well. Things seem to have worked out okay as they did win the Super Bowl. But what I'm curious to know is, do you think this is going to be the new philosophy going forward with, with the Chiefs is to try to get by with some lesser known wide receivers because they believe they have the ultimate X factor with quarterback Patrick Mahomes and head coach Andy Reid calling the plays? Yeah, I mean, it definitely could be. And you look to this offseason, I would say that the number one question mark that the Chiefs have going into the 2023 season is wide receiver. And it's the same sort of thing as last year. But um, it, it's funny how, you know, the I think sometimes fans get caught up in the names and who's out there. And obviously, DeAndre Hopkins, for a while, a lot of people thought he would be signing with the Chiefs. And, you know, who knows? If we, he's most likely not going to. But um, I guess that hasn't been settled completely yet. But um, that was sort of going to be the narrative of last year, which was like, can the Chiefs do this with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes and a really good offense and guys that aren't as proven at receiver? And they answered the question with flying colors, right? I mean, they won a Super Bowl. They went 14-3. to They had the number one seed in the AFC. Um, they beat the Eagles in the Super Bowl. So it is kind of funny to go to the next offseason and kind of hear the same things from fans um, from the previous year when um, – we saw last year the Chiefs were still pretty good when they had other guys out there. Now, they did lose Juju Smith-Schuster to the Patriots, and so that is uh, one of those positions when uh, where they're going to need a little bit more help uh, to have somebody emerge. But uh, I still think, you know, if you're looking at this roster and who where potentially you can take a step back or maybe not have the talent of other places, you want it in a place where Patrick Mahomes can potentially lift it, Andy Reid can potentially lift it, and receiver seems to be that spot. The Chiefs seem to be running wide open, get lots of yards after the catch, and a lot of that goes to the quarterback and the head coach, and as long as they have those two in place, then it seems like the Chiefs should be set up at that particular position. Yeah, it kind of reminds me back to the the glory days uh, of the Tom Brady era with the Patriots when, you know, other than when they had Randy Moss, of course they had Gronkowski all those years too, but they didn't really have a big-time wide receiver, and, and it kind of that kind of reminds me of what the Chiefs are doing here, at least last season and maybe going forward. Now, I did mention one of those wide receivers, Sky Moore, as, as one of the guys who was drafted last year to, to try to help and make up some of that production that was lost with Tyreek Hill. He had a disappointing rookie season, only caught 22 balls for 250 yards. Uh, what, what's the latest with his offseason progress? What are the coaches saying about him? And, and what have you seen from him in the limited viewing that you get during OTAs and minicamp? Yeah, he's been one of the most impressive, honestly. Um, and we've talked to a lot of different people about him and talked to him actually this week as well, just about how he's progressed. And The biggest thing right now for him is just trust in that building trust with Patrick Mahomes. There's a reason that Mahomes and Kelsey uh, are so great together on the field, which is they kind of just have this wavelength. You know what I mean? If they see zone coverage and Kelsey sits down, Patrick sees that and he throws it in the right spot. There were times last year where Patrick Mahomes and Sky Moore, they didn't have that same sort of chemistry. There was, for example, a a play in the 49ers game um, that she's ended up winning pretty easily, but Sky Moore cut off his route, didn't cut it, I guess straight enough or straight uh, kind of a dig route on the inside of the field and let the cornerback jump him. And because of the cornerback got the interception. And so we talked to Andy Reid afterwards and he said, Hey, look, 
that's a route where Sky has to make sure the defender doesn't come over the top of him. And so you can see and understand, like, if Patrick Holmes trusts you to, to run the right route and he ends up with an interception because of it, that sort of thing is going to take development over time to know that if he throws that ball there, you're not going to let him down again. And so we talked to Sky more, like I said, this week, and, and that was the main thing I asked him. And I said, what's, what are your aspirations? What are your goals? And, and that was basically what he said, to have – Patrick Mahomes trusts me to have him know he can rely upon me. But, you know, he came back. Uh, he looks like he's in great shape. He's catching everything here at OTAs and mandatory minicamp. And he is one of those guys. Um, it takes a while to learn an Andy Reid offense. It takes a while to kind of get comfortable with that. And they threw a lot at him last year. You know, they had him play multiple receiver positions. He was the punt returner, and he fumbled three of those punts last year before – uh, making up for it in the AC Championship game with a big return. So they did throw uh, a whole lot at him, and uh, he had some ups and downs to go through. But if I was going to make a bet on a player taking a jump for the Chiefs this year, I think Sky Moore would be the, the, pl- the place I'd put it, just because of how he's looked so far and just an ability, I think, to be able to be more comfortable in a system that can be complex for rookies as it was a year ago for him. And of course, he did have the touchdown in the Super Bowl win for the Chiefs, so maybe that'll he'll carry some of that momentum and confidence into this season. Uh, another receiver that I want to ask you about quickly is Kadarius Tony. They brought him in last year. Of course, he was drafted by the Giants, couldn't stay healthy with the Giants. Um, what are the expectations for Tony? Uh, do, do the Chiefs believe that he could step up and become a, a number one wide receiver target for Patrick Mahomes? Yeah, so he's really fascinating because the Chiefs have super high hopes for him. And they saw flashes last year where he did things that maybe they didn't even think he could do, where running down the sideline, catching jump balls, um, you know, battling for them in the air. Obviously, he's really, really good in short spaces. You know, the old cliche, you can make a guy miss in a phone booth. That, that's Kadarius. You know, he had that big punt return in the Super Bowl that really turned the game as well, where he kind of backstepped a guy and then had the longest punt return in Super Bowl history. So he has all the tools. It's just a matter of him staying healthy and being on the field and being reliable, too. I mean, we talk about Sky Moore only having one year with Patrick Mahomes and in the Andy Reid offense. Well, Kadarius Tony got traded midseason last year. So really, he was sort of used as a, here are your plays when you get in there, here's what you do, and kind of limiting it that way. But if you look at his numbers and his usage, he was one of the most highly used guys uh, in terms of how many times it was given to him on a run or a pass per play of any player in the NFL. So they want to expand his role. They want him to do more. They think there's more in there they can unlock. It's just a matter of him staying healthy and him not having injury problems that he's had in the past. And so, um, you know, OTAs, mandatory minicamp, it's kind of been off and on for him. He's been there most of the time, sometimes done, sometimes has done team activities, sometimes not. So, it's kind of a we'll see mode, but um, he's a fascinating player. He really does bring a lot of upside, and the Chiefs have super high hopes for him. They've had guys throughout this offseason say that he can be the Chiefs' number one receiver next year. It's just a matter of him showing that he can do it and being on the field to prove that he can do it. And those two things are still question marks as we head into the 2023 season. Our guest this week is Jesse Newell, Chiefs beat writer for the Kansas City Star. We are going behind enemy lines this week on the show. And, and Jesse, I want to I want to ask you about the offensive line. I know Orlando Brown, he was not retained uh, this past offseason. He opted to sign with the Bengals, and they brought in Jawan Taylor, who was going to be his replacement uh, over at left tackle. And, and the Chiefs also lost their right tackle, Andrew Wiley. Uh, through free agency, so a little bit of a shake up there on the O line. What's the what's the outlook there uh, at the tackle positions? Yeah, so it's it's kind of fascinating because you know that they made shirts for the Super Bowl parade about zero um, zero sacks given up to the Eagles in the Super Bowl, and you know we have to be honest, the uh, turf that was played out there at State Farm Stadium was not very good, very slippery, and a lot of Eagles falling down, but. Still, I mean, a lot of talk of those two weeks, I know I was there, was how is the pass rush for the Eagles that was the best in the NFL all season going to play against the tackles of the Chiefs who had struggled some? And so um, the Chiefs played well in that game, but as you said, uh, moved on from both those guys in the offseason. I really think the Chiefs are kind of shooting for the moon here, uh, if you look at those two signings. Juwan Taylor is a right tackle from Jacksonville, as you mentioned, a really good pass blocker, really athletic, very young to be getting his second contract. Um, but, you know, they still see upside in him. They're going to keep him, at least for now, at right tackle and let him develop there. But that was one of the top offensive line contracts of the offseason, free agency-wise, of any team out there. So the Chiefs obviously have high hopes for him and believe that they, there's more that they can get into, uh, tap into with him. And, you know, they are going to always be, and this is shown in football to be the smart play, at least statistically, under any read, they're always going to be more pass-prone than they are run 
prone. So um, they had some success last year in the run game that they did in previous seasons, but at the same time, they're going to throw it more than they run it. And so uh, Jawan Taylor, a really good pass protector. On the left side, it, it's it's kind of fascinating to say it this way, but you know the Chiefs waited until after the draft and got really a, a very um, very small deal on on Donovan Smith, the uh, the the, um, the left tackle uh, that they have coming in. Um, the crazy thing about this one, it kind of reminds me of. Uh, the Juju Smith-Schuster signing last year for the Chiefs. I know different positions, but Juju was coming off an injury. He wanted to regain his value. He signed a one-year deal with the Chiefs, so it was incentive-laden. The, the whole kind of point of this was to basically regain your value with the Chiefs, go potentially win a Super Bowl, and then go get a big free agent contract the next year. And that's exactly what Juju did. You know what I mean? Like, he regained his value. He stayed healthy most of the year. He was the Chiefs' number one receiver outside of uh, – outside of Travis Kelsey, and he won a Super Bowl, and now he's with the Patriots and has more money uh, than he did the year before. So Donovan Smith, you're looking about the same thing. His base salary is just under $3 million. Incentives can get up to nine, but he was a guy that was super injured last year and played through it, and because of that, a lot of like the pro football focus grades you look at uh, really tanked for him, and it seems like it's injury-related, but he's got to now prove that. And so um, he takes a, a very short-term deal with the Chiefs. It's one year. He wants to rebuild value, potentially win the Super Bowl, and then go out in the free agent market again. And so the Chiefs are kind of a perfect landing spot for these types of players because you're put in such a really good situation where Patrick Holmes doesn't take many sacks and, and you've got Andy Reid behind the scenes making all these play calls that are probably going to make you look good. So fascinating for the Chiefs is that they traded some security of what they knew they had and kind of went for the upside play of both of those players. And um, there is some question mark, especially on the left side with Donovan Smith. You know, he did not play well last year while battling through those injuries, but uh, it is sort of a, a fascinating thing to watch for the Chiefs this year just because they did not go with status quo and decided to, to kind of go for higher upside, and we'll see if it plays out well and the way that they want it to. Okay, so I gave some misinformation there. So Jawan Taylor is going to be playing right tackle. I, I know he has played primarily right tackle throughout his career. I, I didn't know if they were going to put him on the left side or not. You you cleared that up for us, so thanks for that. Uh, you know, I, I want to jump over to the defense right now. The big the big news surrounding the defense is, of course, Chris Jones, his absence from all offseason workouts, OTAs and mini camp. He's looking for a new contract extension, uh, rightfully so. He had 15 and a half sacks last year. He's one of the top three uh, interior defensive linemen in, in, in football, in my opinion. Um, how do you see this playing out? Do you foresee this lingering on into the start of training camp? Yeah, so this is a fascinating one. And, um, you know, <laughs> We can kind of compare it to Tyreek Hill last year because this is sort of the moment where the Chiefs would have traded Tyreek Hill and got all those, you know, draft picks and used those draft picks and got real, you know, a lot younger on defense. And so many of those players made plays in the AFC Championship game and Super Bowl that allowed them to to win the Super Bowl. That you can understand why that thing is, is sort of a, an attractive thing how it turned out for the Chiefs and especially as we talked about them not maybe needing as many receivers with Patrick Mahomes as your quarterback and Andy Reid as your coach. But this is a little different because. Patrick Mahomes can't save the defense, and that's really what Chris Jones did for most of last season with 15 and a half sacks. Um, I think probably consensus-wise you would say, or most analysts would say, that he was a top three defensive player in the NFL. Um, you know, Getting into his late 20s now, but still at a point where you would think he'd be productive for three to four more years, especially as uh, the age curve goes for interior defensive linemen. So this one's fascinating because he sat out mandatory minicamp. Uh, he's going to incur almost $100,000 in fines because of that. Um, the Chiefs just had a recently um, this week, they had their ring ceremony and we talked to Brett Beats there about the contract situation. And he said, well, you know, you've still got time. They said they have constant communication and they've had open communication with Chris Jones agency. And so they feel good about the relationship there. And, you know, to quote him, he said, we look forward to Chris being here, not just for next year, but for a long time. But something also fascinating is that Brett Beats figured that Chris Jones was going to be at that ceremony where the whole team celebrates and comes back and gets their ring. And, uh, maybe he was there, but at least us on the red carpet did not see him there. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Chris Jones. The only difference here with the Tyreek Hill situation is when the Chiefs pulled that trade in March, they were able to get draft picks for guys for the next month. You know what I mean? They were able to get guys that were able to help them win in that current season. Now with the NFL draft passed, if, if you wanted to trade Chris Jones for a big bounty, and I would assume a lot of teams out there would trade a lot for Chris Jones, especially in his prime, especially at that position, you'd be getting draft picks for next year. And, and we know this Chiefs team, they're built to win right now. You know, they, they should try to aim to win right now. So the delayed gratification from that might not be worth the squeeze here. So it'll be a fascinating one to track. Um, Chris Jones sat out mandatory minicamp uh, back in 2019 at the end of his rookie deal. 
He ended up showing up to, to a training camp a month later and they ended up getting a long-term deal done on the last day. Maybe it plays out like that. We'll see if he shows up to training camp. But for right now, it's uh, it's the Chiefs kind of holding on, holding their breath. And we'll see if Chris Jones makes this a big deal when training camp starts next month in St. Joseph, Missouri. Yeah, that is fascinating. The fact that you mentioned, you know, possibility of a trade. I know Raider fans would not be sad to see him leave that division. That's for sure. But the last thing I wanted to uh, get to before we, we let you go here is just some of the, the rookies that were drafted. Is, is there anyone that we should we should get to know? Maybe someone who the Chiefs are expecting to step in immediately and contribute and, and be a factor early on. Yeah, I mean, I can mention a couple. It's uh, they really had a fascinating draft in that. Um, it looked like they really wanted to trade up in the first round, and it just didn't play out the way they wanted to. The board didn't really fall to them in the right way, and the teams, it seemed like they just wanted to get a receiver, but the teams that they wanted to trade up with also wanted a receiver, like Baltimore in that you know early 20s range. So they ended up kind of holding their water and, and staying back for Felix Enideke Uzama. Um, he's a local kid from K-State, an edge rusher. He's been injured throughout um, rookie minicamp, and so a little bit delayed there with a hand injury. Um, but if he gets on the field, he's a guy that has an array of pass rush moves and they're getting younger there, you know, with him and then George Karloftis, who they drafted in the first round last year. If those two guys can kind of come along at the same time, that could give them a nice pass rush for years to come. Another one to watch is Rasheed Rice. They traded up to get him in the second round. Um, and he's a receiver that Patrick Mahomes threw to in workouts before the draft and seemed to like. That seems like the guy they want to replace Juju Smith Schuster. But I got to be honest with you, through OTAs and through mandatory minicamp, uh, he seems to be a little bit behind, and we talked last year with Sky Moore. I mean, sometimes rookie receivers can be behind in this Chiefs offense. So if you're expecting him to contribute right away, I might be asking too much, at least at this point in time. Again, I'll, very early, still months to go with that to see if something develops there. Um, a couple other ones. Shamari Connor is a the guy they took in the fourth round, uh, cornerback, but uh, kind of a safety corner hybrid. Definitely expect him on special teams as a big hitter. Uh, but, you know, Spagnola loves these versatile players, so he could get on the field very early. Been doing a lot of mandatory minicamp for the Chiefs. And one just guy you just have to look out for, Daenerys Prince. Uh, he is a guy, there's a stat out there that they've been keeping, is speed score. It, it basically rewards the running backs who are both big and really fast. And in that speed score measure, Daenerys Prince, undrafted rookie out of Tulsa, was number one. But John Robinson was number two. And Jameer Gibbs was number three. And the Chiefs are able to get him as an undrafted rookie. They love him so far. He's been one of the stories of training camp. He's actually been receiving the ball in the backfield really well, too, which is only a bonus in Andy Reid's offense. So um, he'll be the kick returner to start the year, most likely. And, oh, by the way, the guy who led in speed score last year uh, out of all NFL-eligible players in the draft, that would be Isaiah Pacheco. And they started him as kick returner. They eased him into the offense. And we know how that turned out. He ended up with over 1,000 rushing yards when you combine the regular season and the postseason. So kind of an Isaiah Pacheco clone there with Daenerys Prince, but an undrafted rookie to keep your eye on if you're watching the Chiefs. And definitely somebody I think you'll see in the division here when the regular season comes. Yeah, sounds like business as usual in Kansas City. And, and of course, everyone's trying to chase the Chiefs in this division. I've said it many times, as long as Patrick Mahomes has got a pulse, this division and this conference really will continue to go through Kansas City. Jesse Newell, we thank you for the time. You gave us a great bit of information there. Rest up. Now you got a little over a month before training camp gets going. I know it's a busy time of uh, not only for the players and the coaches, but for the guys like yourself who cover the team as well. So take care and, and we'll, we'll get you on again once the season starts. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Evan. All right. That was Jesse Newell from the Kansas City Star giving us a update there on the Chiefs. And, you know, I, I, I do think, and I mentioned this, I, I, I it does remind me of of the Patriots, what they're doing with Brady or what they're doing with Mahomes and, you know, not having to surround him with a ton of talent because he's that good. You know, he's got a security blanket and Travis Kelsey, who, you know, who, who knows how much longer he'll be around, but he didn't show any signs of slowing down last year, but they... Paid Mahomes the big money, so the cap took a bit of a hit, but the the philosophy is to protect him with an offensive line and then draft well, especially on defense, and continue to just build with young, cheap talent. And as long as you got Mahomes there, he's going to give you a chance. It paid off for them last year, and, and I don't see any reason why you know that wouldn't be the case again this year. The Chiefs are going to be the favorites in the division. And I would expect them to be favorites again uh, in the conference to, you know, be a contender there uh, at the end of the season uh, in the AFC. 
Now, will the Bengals or the Bills or the Chargers or, you know, the G- the Jaguars who showed some promise last year are one of these young teams? The Dolphins maybe could be a surprise team this year. The Jets, that's another team they went out and, you know, made a big splash. Are one of these other teams here going to be able to challenge the Chiefs and dethrone them and take them down here uh, once and for all? Anyways, guys, that is going to do it here for this week's show. Again, happy Father's Day to all of you guys out there. Enjoy the weekend. Uh, You can expect to hear from me again in in about two weeks. I'm going to take a week off next week. Unless, again, if any breaking news happens, I'll be right here with you. But until then, uh, I am your host, Evan Grote. Take care, everybody. And just win, baby.